Well, uh, <clears throat> in addition me to being uh, grateful for this great, great honor from an organization uh, whose progress I have followed since literally the weeks and months before it was born when it was still a germ in Frank Gaffney's brain. In addition to uh, that, I, uh, I've been doubly rewarded by that introduction. I mean, how would you like to be introduced in those terms? <laughs> it was wonderful. Normally, I would tell a joke, but I'm told that uh, we have to get out of here pretty soon, and I have a, I have a longer than usual talk, so you'll have, to, you'll, ha you'll have to suffer the absence of any merriment here, because the tidings I bring in my talk are very grim indeed. So what I want to talk to you about today is what John McCain once called the most serious crisis we have faced since the end of the Cold War. Yet I would guess that not even everyone gathered in this well-informed room would be able to identify the crisis McCain was talking about. It was, of course, Iran's quest for nuclear weapons. What then to do? President Bush kept declaring that Iran must not be permitted to get the bomb. And he kept warning that the military option, by which he meant airstrikes, not an invasion on the ground, was still on the table as a last resort. Then, suddenly, in November of 2007, the world was hit with a different kind of bomb. This took the form of an unclassified summary of a new national intelligence estimate that was obviously designed to blow up the near universal consensus that had flowed from the conclusions reached by the intelligence community itself in its 2005 NIE. In brief, whereas the NIE of 2005 had assessed with high confidence, and I'm quoting, that Iran currently is determined to develop nuclear weapons, close quote. The new NIE of 2007 did not, quote, know whether Iran currently intends to develop nuclear weapons. Well, we now have the evidence to prove that the NIE of 2007 was wrong. If we permitted Iran to build a nuclear arsenal, people 50 years from now would look back and wonder how we of this generation could have allowed such a thing to happen. And they would rightly judge us as harshly as we today judge the British and the French for what they did at Munich in 1938. Why, I wondered, would Bush put himself so squarely in the dock of history on this issue if he were resigned to an Iran in possession of nuclear weapons? Thanks to the new NIE, however, what had been politically very difficult for Bush to do before now became altogether impossible. But what about the Israelis? How could they afford to sit by while a regime pledged to wipe them off the map was equipping itself with nuclear weapons and the missiles to deliver them? For unless Iran could be stopped before acquiring a nuclear capability, the Israelis would be confronted with only two choices, either strike first or pray that the fear of retaliation would deter the Iranians from beating them to the punch. Yet a former president of Iran, Hashemi Rafsanjani, had served notice that his country could not be deterred by the fear of retaliation. And I quote him. If a day comes when the world of Islam is duly equipped with the arms Israel has in its possession, application of an atomic bomb would not leave anything in Israel, but the same thing would just produce damages in the Muslim world. If this was the view of even a supposed moderate like Rafsanjani, how could the Israelis depend upon the mullahs to refrain from launching a first strike? Under the aegis of such an attitude, mutual assured destruction would turn into a very weak read indeed. Understanding that, the Israelis would be presented with an irresistible incentive to preempt, and so too would the Iranians. 
Either way, a nuclear exchange would become, if not inevitable, then terrifyingly likely. What would happen then? In a careful study, Anthony Kordsman of the Center for Strategic and International Studies, no friend of Israel, argued that even in the doubtful assumption that such a nuclear exchange could be contained within the region, the resulting horrors would include the death of tens of millions and the obliteration of whole societies. But what would happen if Israel were to strike Iran before it reached the point of no return? At worst, and this is my own scenario, not Kordsman's, the Mullahs would retaliate by attacking Israel with missiles armed with non-nuclear warheads, but possibly containing biological and or chemical weapons. They would also do their utmost to destabilize Iraq, to make more trouble for us in Afghanistan, and to close the Straits of Hormuz. There would be a vast increase in the price of oil with catastrophic consequences for every economy in the world, very much including our own. And there would be a deafening outcry from one end of the earth to the other against the inescapable civilian casualties. Yet, bad as all this would be, it does not begin to compare with the gruesome consequences of a nuclear exchange between Israel and Iran. Now, I think that if not for having been ambushed by the NIE of 2007, Bush might well have taken military action. For he believed, as I do too, that there was an uncanny resemblance between the situation we were in and the one the world faced in 1938. In 1938, as Winston Churchill later said, Hitler could still have been stopped at a relatively low price and many millions of lives could have been saved if England and France had not de deceived themselves about the realities of their situation. Mutatis mutandis, it is the same today, when Iran can still be stopped from getting the bomb, and even more millions of lives can be saved. Yet, if Bush was prevented by external obstacles from acting on this assessment, the obstacles standing in the way of Barack Obama are lodged within his own mind and heart. Which is to say that, in spite of his defense of just wars in his Nobel speech, it is next to inconceivable that he will take military action against Iran. And at the rate the centrifuges are already spinning, Iran will have the bomb before the courageous dissenters now demonstrating in the streets of Tehran can, if indeed they ever can, grow strong enough to overthrow the malocracy. The upshot is that with time running rapidly out, only the Israelis can save us all from a nuclear Armageddon. I believe that the Israelis are prepared to do it, but I also believe that Barack Obama is prepared to stop them and that he may succeed in doing so. In that case, God help the Israelis and the rest of us as well. I apologize for bringing you such glad tidings on this happy occasion.